Batman the Animated Series was groundbreaking animation. You know that, we know that, we have a whole YouTube channel about it. But the show wouldn't have happened without the success of the 1989 Batman feature film and a blessing from its director, Tim Burton. Today, we'll be going over all the stuff that BTAS borrowed from the Burton films, from music to character designs to origin stories, everything else in between. So don't go anywhere. Showtime, everybody! Uh-huh. Engagement. They can talk all they like. That means everything. Don't forget that. You heard it, folks! Before the 89 film, the Batman character was widely considered to be nothing but camp because of the 1960s television series with Adam West, with all of its crazy colors, celebrity guests, and chaotic plots. But dedicated comic readers of the 80s already knew Batman to be a much darker character, with books like Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns and Alan Moore's The Killing Joke. Burden's Batman took cues from those stories, which on the film's initial announcement polarized fans who grew up with Adam West, as well as comic book guys who didn't think Michael Mr. Mom Keaton could switch from comedy to a dark superhero, despite Keaton and Burden's work together on the cult classic Beetlejuice in 88. Work on BTAS began in 1990, only a year after the first Batman film's release. Warner Brothers' newest sequel was on the way in Batman Returns, and wanted a new weekly cartoon to accompany the film in 1992, so let's provide another means of merchandising for the character. Batman was Warner Brothers' hottest superhero property, and arguably still is today. There was initially some hesitation as to whether anyone would actually watch a superhero cartoon, especially at the scale that Gene McCurdy, president of Warner Brothers Animation, desired, since she was kind of spoiled by working with Steven Spielberg on Tiny Toons, and wanted Warner Brothers to be regarded as the catalyst lack of TV animation. She didn't want to do it cheaply, especially since there was a lot of money invested in the Batman franchise with the film. When McCurdy brought the entire Warner Brothers animation department together to announce their intention for a Batman cartoon, Tiny Toons writer and storyboard artist Bruce Timm was especially inspired, took it upon himself to draw a handful of animated Batman character designs. At the same time, Eric Radomski, Tiny Toons' background painter, created a trial painting that depicted lights of Gotham City reflected on wet pavement, directly inspired by the drama and tone of Tim Burton's movie. Tim and Rodomsky were called into McCurdy's office and asked to put together a mini pilot, later dubbed The Dark Knight's First Night, with various voices by Tim and Rodomsky and music from Danny Elfman's original Batman soundtrack. This test animation was eventually used by McCurdy to sell Tim and Rodomsky as the creative team behind Batman the Animated Series to the higher ups at WB and Fox. While most of us may credit Tim with revitalizing Batman, Tim attributes Burden for first bringing the concept of a serious superhero to a mass audience, because Burden focused his take on the shadowy Avenger of the early Kane and Finger comics, instead of the campy 60s version, placing Batman as a dark character in the public once more. We were actually quite lucky. When that show was being developed, we were coming off the heels of the Tim Burton Batman films, which were very dark in tone. Warner Brothers Animation recognized that BTAS needed to stick close to the Burton films for synergy purposes, so the animated series generally got a pass for the occasional violence, cerebral tone, and realistic guns that wouldn't have been allowed for other cartoons at the time. The show's producers were allowed to push network standards so long as they stayed as close to that tone as possible, although BTAS served more as an extension rather than a direct continuation of Burton's franchise, not intended to share continuity, something that Tim championed from the start. He even designed On Leather Wings to be the premiere episode as a Man Bat feature so it wouldn't have any villains to be compared to the movies. We had a love-hate thing going on with the Tim Burton movies. Obviously, our show would have never gotten made if it hadn't been for that first Batman movie. There are some interesting parallels somewhat in the design of the movie and what we did, but I made it clear to Gene when we first got the gig that I didn't want to make the TV show just a spin-off of the movie. I didn't want the show to look just like the movie. I didn't want to use their Batman design. I didn't want to use much of anything they did. I wanted the show to be unique. Not only that, but I had my own ideas of what Batman was. They coincided in some places with the movie, and some places they didn't. Although, there was an extended period of time where Warner Brothers Animation considered reaching out to Burton to serve as an executive producer on the animated series. There was this weird kind of passive-aggressive thing coming from Fox that because Warner Brothers had won in Tiny Toons with Steven Spielberg, for some reason the people at Fox thought it would be a really cool idea if we had somebody big, a stunt casting name like Steven Spielberg attached to the Batman show. This was after the first Tim Burton Batman movie had come out, so they thought, wow, it would be really great if we could get Tim Burton involved with the show, and everyone went, yeah, that's a great idea, except for Eric and I. We were just kind of going, you know, that's probably not going to happen, and we don't necessarily 
want another creative cook in the kitchen. So we kind of reluctantly said, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. In the meantime, somebody through backdoor channels was trying to get Tim Burton interested in it, and in the meantime, Fox said, don't develop the show yet until we get Tim on board. So we're sitting around, we've already started to hire people, and we can't get going. We can't even get the scripts developed because they said, let's wait for Tim Burton. So literally a couple months go by, and we realize we can't wait. So under the radar, we started getting some scripts in the pipeline. At that point, I was technically the story editor because we didn't have a story editor. So I contacted an old friend of mine named Mitch Bryan to write the very first episode. Actually, he and Paul Dini and I had actually written the rough Bible for the show on a freelance basis. Paul Dini, who was still working on Tiny Toons at the time, also recognized that when Burton's Batman film came out, that was a way to go for the animated series. The show borrowed its otherworldly timeliness aesthetic from the film as well, as described by Tim and Rodomsky in the audio commentary for On Leather Wings, in developing the show's look, which was greatly influenced by architecture and design from the golden age of industrial America. Both the film and show included gargoyles ornamenting cathedrals, and featured the Gotham Globe newspaper, which employed reporter Vicki Vale in the first Burden film, though her function was replaced by Summer Gleason for the show, but without any romance with Bruce Wayne. The animated Gotham City became a blend of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, because the BTAS team examined what worked in Burden's designs, and borrowed all of the best aspects. Tim Burton and Anton First used retro deco elements in their version of Gotham City as well, but theirs was more of an ugly take to it. It was a deliberately ugly, brutal take on the futuristic design, and we didn't really want to go that way. It certainly worked for the movie, but we wanted more of a pure, old-fashioned kind of art deco. Burton and First were probably influenced by the same sources we were. There was an architectural visionary named Hugh Ferris who did these elaborate, futuristic cityscape architectural renderings. They were just gorgeous, these massive deco buildings rendered very very moodily. That was one of our prime influences on the look of the show. I'm sure Burton and First were looking at that stuff too, and then they went off in their own direction with it. Inspired by the Burton Batcave, its animated counterpart featured a computer console and other random equipment in a giant open cavern, with all the tech resting on nothing but raised stalactites above a steep chasm, much more distinct than the traditional comics cave. Warner Brothers' larger budget allowed the animated series to hire an orchestra to perform original music for every episode, most of which was composed by Shirley Walker, who worked with Danny Elfman on the Batman feature film soundtrack. The original Batman opening theme score is perhaps one of the most awesome things to come out of Burden's film, and has become as legendary and recognizable as John Williams' Superman theme song. Walker scored BTAS in the same style as the Batman feature film, and used Elfman's theme as a starting point for the rest of her work. Tim and company were very impressed with the Danny Elfman Batman theme, and repurposed the song as an animated series intro. Walker's team subtly used it throughout the first season, as well as the opening minutes of Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero. The theme has become so iconic that his legacy carries on, including use in the Joss Whedon theatrical cut of Justice League and Justice League action episode Timeshare, which directly paid homage to BTAS with a similar shot to the end of the anime series opening theme song. While the Danny Elfman theme is amazing, you also gotta love Shirley Walker's original Batman theme that came out of the anime series. Honestly, so S-tier, just like all the folks that I'm about to shout out for donating to our Patreon page. Hello, Gotham Cornerstone? Yes, we seem to be down to our last diet crew. Oh, hey, um, I didn't know you could be in the car with me. I need to talk to James Strecker about setting some boundaries for these Patreon perks. Patreon.com slash GCAU Watchtower. We've got so much cool bonus stuff going on over there. Apparently you can hang out with me in my car. I didn't know that was a thing. Every month you can vote on which video essay we're gonna do. That's how this Tim Burton Batman video came to be this month. That was one of the ones we voted on. We've also got custom artwork. We do live video chat hangouts with us once a month. We even will do like a spaghetti noodle dinner with you. We'll fly over to your house or apartment or whatever and eat spaghetti with you when it's not a pandemic. Something to look forward to one day. People who've joined our Patreon pack this month, I wanna give them a shout out. Specifically, Justin Romy. Welcome to our Patreon page. We're happy to have have you. We've also got Jimmy Barra. Sounds like a baseball player. I don't know why. Tony, Tony Barra? I don't know. What, what am I doing? I don't know baseball. And Squidward Tentacles. Welcome, welcome to our Patreon page, Squidward. And as always, we've got the reoccurring usual suspects of Robert Sterling, Aaron Young, Cameo Shadowness, Cody Hazel Malik, Luke Mears, Mac, and Richard Mon 12. I almost had that all memorized. I wasn't quite there, but I was really close. One day I'll have it. They know that we love them. Thanks for, uh, I don't know. Dealing with this little interruption to the video, let's get back to Tim Burton stuff. Just for the taste of it, Diet Coke. 
We've looked at the design influences taken from the Burton films, but now let's assess how the films inform the overlapping characters, like the Joker, the Penguin, Catwoman, and Batman. Paul Dini explained in the Writer's Bible that with the exception of the Joker, Penguin, and Catwoman, each time we initially meet a villain, it will be Batman's first encounter as well, despite Catwoman having a first encounter with Batman in The Cat and the Claw Part 1. We can assume that the Joker, Penguin, and Catwoman did not initially have their origins conveyed on screen because they were each covered in the Burton films. However, the Writer's Bible itself dives into these origins. Some are similar, while others are pretty drastically different. Dini is on record as being a fan of Jack Nicholson's interpretation of the Joker. Nicholson looks phenomenal and scary and the suit looks good and the darkness and the world. I was thinking like, wow, this rocks. The Joker first appeared in 1940's Batman number no. one, but didn't gain an origin story until 11 years later in Detective Comics number no. 168 by co-creators Bill Finger and Bob Kane, where he was originally the leader of the Red Hood mob. He disappeared after falling into a vat of chemicals to become the clown prince of crime. This origin was adapted in the 1989 Batman film, but with the Joker holding the identity of gangster Jack Napier. A decision producer Michael Uslan has stated was made to simplify things rather than giving the Joker three identities. Though the origin carried over into the anime series, as seen in the episodes Beware the Creeper and Mad Love, the Joker only used Jack Napier as one of many criminal aliases, specifically referenced in the episodes Dreams and Darkness, as stated by Arkham Asylum's Dr. Bartholomew, and in a file about the Joker and Joker's Wild. He also appeared as a pre-Joker mobster during the flashback sequences of Batman Mask of the Phantasm. When we spoke to writer Randy Rogel a while back, the screenwriter shed some light on why the Joker's origin elements were slightly different in the anime series than the Burden film. Batman used to be Warner Brothers' biggest investment every two years. Mm -hmm. They would have another Batman movie. Tim Burton's first one did surprisingly did so well because nobody was really doing superheroes. Batman was such a big hit. When they brought on Jack Nicholson, he was the big star in the room. Jack Nicholson got to own that origin story. You know, if you did that origin story, you had to pay a royalty to Jack Nicholson. <laughs> I remember when we were writing our, you know, we had to be a, a, a cognizant of that. The animated series also mimicked the Joker's wardrobe from the 1989 Batman film. The Joker's tie in the museum scene from the Burton film is nearly identical to the animated series, and both iterations of the Joker occasionally wear a long-brimmed hat and trench coat. There are also an assortment of visual shot similarities, with the Joker wearing the same yellow boarded glasses and harlequinade as Jack Nicholson did in the film, as well as the Joker holding up a plate of laughing fish on TV, similarly to what Nicholson did with the liquor bottle in the film. On multiple occasions, the animated crew would even mimic the Joker's scenes, though not always with the Joker himself. In the episode Two-Face Part 1, Harvey Dent asked to see a mirror after taking off his bandages to reveal his new face, which was eerily similar to the 1989 Batman film where the Joker first removes his own bandages and asks for a mirror to see his new transformed face. Thematically, the confrontation between Joker and Arthur Reeves in Batman Mask of the Phantasm is similar to when the Joker attacks Carl Grissom in his office, from the way he's dressed to how he enters the room, and just simply engaging someone from his mobster past. The Burden film also also has a scene where the Joker releases tons of cash into the streets of Gotham during a parade. The terrible trio pull the same trick during their chase with Batman. Catwoman, on the other hand, had an unrelated origin to Dini's initial development materials, presenting a version of Selina Kyle who was rich and mysterious, rather than Michelle Pfeiffer's stressed out secretary to businessman Max Schreck, who tried to kill her but actually transformed her into a supernatural Catwoman born of an alley in 1992's Batman Returns. Tim's initial designs for Catwoman included an early model sheet with a more Julie Newmar inspired look from the 1966 TV series. Catwoman was to be depicted with blonde hair to more closely match Michelle Pfeiffer's look in Batman Returns. Terms, though the character was originally a blonde in the Golden Age Batman comics as well. In retrospect, Tim wished he had made Catwoman more like the film appearance because he thought that the black costume was really cool, but he was initially put off by all the stitches. He considered it a morbid direction for the character and didn't see Catwoman that way himself. But the all black costume, we ultimately did that later on because we really liked it. But at the time we were just starting Batman, I was terrified of doing a character in all black. I couldn't really expect our guys in Korea to figure it out on their own. So basically, I kind of lied to the lot. I didn't really lie, but I gave them my reasons why I didn't think we could do it. I put her in that all gray costume and sent over to them for approval, and they said, eh, that's close enough. In terms of on-screen similarities, both Batman Returns and Batman the Anime Series, with Catwoman's debut episode The Cat and the Claw Part 1, use similar sequences where Batman discovers and removes one of Catwoman's claws that was stuck in his costume. Catwoman became very popular at the time because of Batman Returns, so there was discussion among Warner Brothers about how to capitalize on the character. For a moment, there was talk about potential spin-off series, but more on that in our recent Lost Episodes video.
The Penguin also initially had a totally different origin and design than Batman Returns, because the show and film were in production at the same time. Burton chose to go in a drastically new origin direction, with his version of the Penguin as portrayed by Danny DeVito. What was fun about that was they didn't have any photographs of Danny DeVito in his costume, and not only that, but they weren't going to give me any. Eric Rodomsky and I went and met with Tim Burton for a short meeting, and Tim sketched out while we were sitting there kind of what they were looking like. His drawing style is almost abstract, it's not realistic at all, it's very cartoony. I I could kind of see where he was going, but it was still a little vague. Then later I got to go over to the studio while they were doing the first costume test on Danny. I wasn't allowed to take pictures, but I brought my sketchbook and got to see him in his full regalia, so I just sat there and sketched him while they were taking pictures. So the Penguin now sported longer hair and flipper fingers rather than the more classic design. He was still deformed in BTAS, but not nearly as much as he was in Batman Returns. The character's colors were swapped from blue to black all around, as informed by DeVito's look. Dan Reba reminisced on early designs for Penguin during our first 2020 interview with him. How with Burton's blessing on the anime series, there was no way they had the guts to betray him and use the Penguin model they originally wanted to, so they went with the movie design. Dini's origin story for the Penguin listed in the writer's bible was originally much more of a mama's boy than the abandoned baby that we saw in the events of Batman Returns. Oswald was bullied by neighborhood kids for being deformed and penguin-shaped, but his mother's pet store and exotic birds were his safe haven. Oswald reached a breaking point as a young adult after the bullies destroyed his mother's birds as a prank, which drove him insane. He formed a gang in revenge, eventually becoming one of the most profitable gangs in Gotham. Because of Batman Returns, the Penguin's origin was discarded in lieu of mystery, so that the two versions of the villain would match. Along with the change in look came a change in character. Our mama's boy became a small but ruthless hoodlum who nevertheless still craved acceptance from a society that shunned him. The film also saw the Penguin ride a giant rubber ducky, which he also used for mobility in the sewers for the anime series episodes Birds of a Feather and The Mechanic. Also like the film, the former episode saw the Penguin attempt to rejoin Gotham socialites, and the latter featured a scene where Penguin took remote control of the Batmobile for his own gains. Gentlemen, start your screaming! <laughs> Yes, and we wrote it first. Yeah, I know. Yes. <laughs> I remember when we saw the movie, we went, wait a minute. Much of the character of Batman himself was borrowed from the Burton interpretation, particularly the way that Batman stayed in the shadows and kept to himself. He was depicted as being more aloof and antisocial, not talking much, though being the featured hero in dozens of episodes throughout the anime series, he had to speak up on occasion. I was particularly taken by the scene where Batman takes Vicky Vale back to the Batcave and he's not making eye contact with her. He's not talking to her, he's just being monosyllabic. I thought that was a cool way to go with the character, and that probably influenced us to a degree. Kevin Conroy also lowered his vocal tone and half whispered to differentiate his Batman voice from Bruce Wayne, as Michael Keaton did, though perhaps not as distinctly as later actors. Now, the character of Max Shrek, as portrayed by Christopher Walken in Batman Returns, was rumored to nearly be a character in the anime series. According to the Wikipedia entry, it was originally believed that Max Shrek was intended to feature as a villain in Batman the anime series, but his inclusion was scrapped and the character of Roland Daggett was created instead. But Bruce Timm himself came to the anime superhero forums previously known as Toon Zone to debunk that rumor on August 13th, 2009, explaining that while they were inspired by the Burden films, they intended to create their own take on Gotham City. It's utter nonsense. Wild fan speculation granted bogus legitimacy by being posted on Wikipedia. Irritating. Never in a million years would we have considered using Max Shrek in BTAS. We had the opportunity to read the Batman Returns script while the movie was in production, and I for one hated the script, did everything in my power to distance us from the movie continuity. I confess I kinda liked the movie itself when it came out, but still. While he was at it, Tim shared his take on Batman Returns, with a few years of hindsight, stating he thought it was, quote, Very snarky, with an air of condescension toward the source material. I don't think either film is entirely successful, but there are great big chunks of each one that I like a lot. Now let's talk about the Batmobile. But first... Now you can get a Batman car and a McDonald's Happy Meal. For the most part, the Art Deco design of the Batmobile looks similar to the one in the Burden films, especially when all the shields were raised. They both largely used the same platform with a stretched wheelbase, long nose, and small cockpit with a sliding canopy set over the rear wheels. The animated series also drew some elements from the 1930s sports roadsters. Instead of a turbine intake like the movie car, the animated Batmobile had a more conventional slatted grille that formed a raised ridge with the engine cover. Both cars had concave wheels and low-profile tires. Both Batmobiles also had comparable gadget components. 
such as a grapple hook that allows the Batmobile to quickly slide around a corner turn, machine guns that emerge out of the front of the Batmobile when needed, wheels with shields that can slide over them, and a turbo flame boost on the back of the car, along with similarly styled brake lights. Batman kept his whip on a turntable pedestal in the Batcave in both the film and show. Another vehicle, the Batwing airship, was a concept that Burton originated for the Batman mythos in his 1989 film, which was also utilized for the animated series. The Batwing is depicted in both the show and film as a stylized bat with a small pilot cabin on top of the ship. There's also a moment in the first Burton Batman film where the Batwing flies above the cloudy Gotham City sky against a bold full moon, which is a very similar shot to the police blimp doing the same move in the animated series premiere episode On Leather Wings. Another original concept from Burton's Batman movie, the grapnel gun, yes, with an N, has also since made its way into comics and other Batman films, but it took BTAS to popularize the gadget. Before the grapnel gun, Batman used a rope attached to a battering to move around Gotham City, even during comic books from the late 1980s, but it was clearly the inspiration for the upgrade. When we did the animated series, we were inspired in part by the tech employed in the movie. Both versions of Batman also do the classic punch a villain without looking move, as seen in Burton's first Batman film, and initially in the Batman the Animated Series episode Heart of Ice. The punch became a classic trope throughout the DCAU. In fact, BTAS director and designer Dan Reba shared this tidbit of trivia with us. Because Keaton had trouble moving, they had to come up with cool minimal moves for Batman. The backwards punch up from behind was one of those. And I remember a few of our board artists doing it until it became a bit of a cliche. And as for Keaton having trouble moving, well specifically, it was turning his head. And he could do it, but it made a loud rubber suction sound. He didn't want to make Batman look dumb. So he never turned his head. Lastly, Tim Burton himself made a cameo in Batman the Animated Series, at least unofficially. His likeness is referenced as an incidental background character in the episode Off Balance. Burton's Batman only received one Academy Award nomination, which it won for art direction, spearheaded by production designers Anton First and Peter Young. It's easy to critique the Burton film for character choices like a Batman killing anyone in his way, or audiences feeling more invested in the villain. Moviegoers have never seen anything like Burton's dark fairy tale take on Batman, so reception was mixed. However, it was the biggest film of 1989, and it still remains in the top 60 films in top domestic gross after inflation. Granted, Burton admitted to doing things differently for his Batman, which caused a clash in 2002 with popular Clerks director Kevin Smith, who jokingly accused Burton of stealing the end of Planet of the Apes from one of Smith's comic books. And in the piece, it said when asked for comment, Tim Burton said, anybody that knows me knows that I would never read a comic book, which to me explains <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Burton never intended for Batman Returns to be his final film entry and wanted to make a third installment, revealing on the director's commentary that he had a meeting with Warner Brothers and it was the studio that wanted to go in a different direction in order to target a more child audience. Because the Burtonverse wasn't seen as kid-friendly, parents wouldn't spend their money on merch for a film they didn't want their kids to watch. When McDonald's released Batman Returns toys with their Happy Meals, parents wrote harsh letters and threatened to boycott the fast food chain, and Warner Brothers read it as a need to redirect the franchise into a brighter direction. Enter Joel Schumacher, but more on that in a future video. Between a cameo by Robert Wools as character of Gotham Globe reporter Alexander Knox in 2019's Crisis on Infinite Earths, and news that Michael Keaton will be reprising his role as Batman for the Flash feature film, the Burdenverse is just as relevant today as the DC animated universe that it helped create. As much as the animated series borrowed from Burden, every series after BTAS, from The Batman, Batman Brave and the Bold, Beware the Batman, and even Teen Titans Go was directly influenced by the anime series in some shape or form. James Strecker is working on a video for what Battenson can learn from BTAS, so be on the lookout for that. Or watch it now if you're from the future, like 40 years from now, whenever now is. But I want to know, what are some of your favorite endearing features of Batman that were first established in the Burden films? Drop a comment down below and let us know your thoughts. We also want to thank our Patreon supporters, so check us out at patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower. See how you can get involved in the video voting process, which helped bring this video to life, as well as all the other cool tiers, like early access to videos like this thing that you just watched, live video chats, custom artwork, so much more. We're also on Twitch now, streaming every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with live book readings, video game playthroughs, whatever else we feel like. We'll get up there and like, midnight and do test streams. I don't know. You don't even have to be a Patreon supporter for any of that stuff. I'm Ted Kendrick. Thank you so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos from the Watchtower database.